Hello and welcome to The Promise Land, a show from the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined as ever by Rob Blanchett. Rob, I am from 90 Min Studios today. You can see all the branding in the back. Uh, yeah. You are in your usual slot, usual spot. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. We need some kind of green screen behind me where we can have 90 Min graphics in the background. So it looks like I'm uh, in the in the 90 min matrix somewhere but no doing well obviously off the back of a, of a famous Manchester United victory in the Europa League which we'll talk about today and some upcoming Premier League action yes indeed uh, what a game it was last night Manchester United getting there in the end Scott McTominay with a dramatic <laughs> dramatic late winner against Ammonia in uh, the Europa League United still in with a shout of actually winning their group they have to win their last two games, but I think they have to beat Real Sociedad by two goals mm. in uh, the final group game in order to come top. And obviously we know that, well, if you don't know, uh, if United come second, they will end up playing against a team that has dropped out of the Champions League to qualify for the last 16, which you'd like to avoid, to be honest. But uh, we'll yeah. see how it goes. Uh, yes, we'll talk about that game. We'll talk about the fallout of it. And we'll also talk about the Newcastle game, which is coming up at the weekend. I think it's a Sunday game, 2 p.m., I believe, UK 2 time. 2 p.m., yep. Rob will be there. I will be watching it from my sofa because of things, other things I have going on. But yes, uh, we'll get into the show in a second. But let me do the plugs. Uh, subscribe wherever you get your pods on Apple, Google, Spotify, and the likes. And watch us on YouTube twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays as well. So head over to the channel, like, subscribe, leave a comment, join the community and follow us on Twitter at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B and at Promise and MU for the show as well. Rob, what were you, what was your big takeaway from last night? Because I know that fans of other clubs will look on and they'll go, wow, they just scrapped and like only just got over the line. I actually thought the performance was okay. I thought the performance was okay. I, I think it's one of these things, isn't it, that, you know, we keep preaching this moderate view of Manchester United and what the team is doing and what, what we have to do game to game to game to improve. This is definitely the type of match that maybe even at the start of this season, they wouldn't have won. They would have struggled to kind of find the solution. Now, we know that in the last 12 months, that's been a big thing for Man United, hasn't it? That that they get into these messy situations, they can't work them out. Uh, they nearly did it, didn't they? At Nicosia, where where they had to, you know, another kind of late show, really, <laughs> near, having to stop the opponent scoring a goal and, and uh, embarrassing you in what would have been a bad result. But here we are, you won the game, 1-0. As I always say, 1-0 is always more than good enough. Take your victory, take your three points and move forward. Yes, indeed. I think that Eric Ten Hag said after the game that he was asked a question if winning was the most important thing and he said no. I think that was just, he obviously he didn't mean that. I don't, I don't think he meant that. But obviously he looked at the amount of chances that United created and missed due to a, 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 good, a really good performance from the opposing goalkeeper, mm. but B, he only made like one or two saves, which were really kind of top notch. Most of the other opportunities that United had, they squandered because they, you know, they put it, made it, this is my opinion anyway, they made it quite easy for the goalkeeper. They put it wide. Uh, great performance from him, but I think United, they just need to be more clinical. I think this was just one of those nights, to be honest, but we saw patterns of play. We saw a number of opportunities created, 30 odd shots. Uh, bossing possession. I know we're talking about the opposition here. United should be doing this against a team like that, but sometimes they don't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it's, I called it rather sarcastically on Twitter afterwards, but also with a little bit of meaning behind it. It was a good training session, actually, you know, because this was a competitive game where United could work on their patterns, work on where to stand, work on where to pass the ball, work on how to recycle it. And I think they did it pretty well. Eric Ten Hag chose a pretty much first choice 11 again, which I was surprised at, but you understand why he's doing it, don't you? So, will that come back to bite them, do you think, or do you think this is the right way to go? I think you may be looking at the in, in the way that with a World Cup coming up, these players are obviously not going to be resting during that. Most of them will be at that tournament. But it very is much a kind of divided season, isn't it? So you kind of got to get your minutes in now. And I do think that if it was just thinking about the totality of the season, 
he maybe be rota- rotating a little bit more. But we're learning stuff about Eric Ten Hag every week, aren't we? About how he likes to do stuff. And he likes to get people out there and and doing repetitions. That's what he wants to see. He wants to see his team, his squad, do the stuff that he's teaching them. And I think he's right. You know, I, I, there's no doubt that this kind of game a year ago would have been heavy rotations, wouldn't it? It would have been seven or eight players out, not really a first team, a fractured display. You just said there about United being wasteful. I, I think I, I took it the other way. I I thought that they hit the target more often than not. And that's something we haven't seen from Manchester United for quite a long time over a period. So not many chances for Cristiano, lots of chances for Marcus, Marcus not scoring. You could take that away as a negative, but I'm actually looking at it with blue sky eyes. I'm thinking, well, actually, they did work the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper did have the game of his life. Yeah, he didn't. They weren't all world class saves or anything like that by by no means. But he kept them in the game. And on another night, if he doesn't do that and doesn't keep them in the game, this is 5-0 with your eyes closed. So I, I think lots of positives for Eric Ten Hag. And like he might have said there, the victory isn't what's important. Of course, when you're in this kind of knockout phase, you're in the groups, you could go out if you lose this game or draw it. You've got to go there and get three points. That's the most important thing. They got their three points. And I think they'll feel good about the victory. They'll come away thinking, could have been embarrassed tonight, but we kept going to the 93rd minute. And in the 93rd minute, the ball ended up in the net. Thanks to a substitute. He's getting a lot of praise for the rotation that he's bringing in within matches. Uh, you know, Ronaldo came on, as a, came on as a sub and scored at Everton the other day. Yeah. Scott McTominay was the one last night. Jaden Sancho has been out of the team recently, but came on and looked brighter, looked a little bit more creative, Definitely. ended up creating the goal. So I think... What I, I'm feeling, a, I'm feeling quite positive actually. I don't want to get too far ahead because obviously we know there's absolutely loads and loads of work to do. But we're just slowly but surely with every game, barring the City game, uh, with every game that we're seeing, somebody is, you know, just improving their performance level a little bit. And we'll, gradually, if you keep building that momentum, fingers crossed, a lot of people will be playing well come the later stages of the season. And that's organic building. That's what we've talked about before. This is what we want to see from Manchester United. So we cannot be disappointed, you know, if they have lots of shots but don't score and only win 1-0. Because as I said, 1-0 is always good enough. So I'm really pleased with this obvious progression that we're seeing. You just mentioned Jaden. We said in the last show, you know, and previous shows, we wanted Jaden to be more prevalent, to be, you know, the future number seven now, to be given those opportunities. But we understood why he was dropped because he hadn't played well in the last few games. I think coming on as a sub, he looked like a different person to me. I don't know what you thought. So when the when the ball ends up in the net and Scotty obviously controls it, slots it away and it's in and you've won one nil, the camera doesn't obviously pan to Jaden, but you see Jaden in the corner and he's like doing a little celebration on his own because he knows that goal's about him. He knows it. So McTominay gets the ball in the box, fires away, you win one nil. Great, well done, Scotty. But that goal was about Jaden Sancho taking the moment, you know, taking saying this is my responsibility to create this. So the fact that he did that, I think, was probably the most pleasing moment for me in the whole match. I really like as well the fact that I know Sancho's only been here for like just over a year, mm. but the fact that he was dropped and now has been replaced by somebody else, in this case, Marcus Rashford, he came on mm. for, um, I think it was Anthony he came, came on for. Mm-hmm. But this competition for places which is starting to grow. And yeah. if you don't perform, you're out of the team. And he knows that because he kind of, uh, you know, ended up creating that goal, it's a, it's a positive action, hopefully getting him back on a positive path to winning his place back. And competition for places is something United haven't had for ages, ages and ages. Yeah, not true competition. So this is the thing about players that maybe can do similar things to each other have unique skill sets themselves, but are competing with each other. Like, you know, I've I've spoke to so many footballers over the years that have said to me the same thing, and that is your biggest opponent every week is the guys in training. They're your biggest opponent because they're the ones that are going to get you kicked out of the team if they play better than you. So Jadon Sancho is in that world. Every Man United player is in that world. Every professional footballer is in that world. So you've got to do it. So I think that was what that little celebration from Jadon was about, not just the goal. But his manager would have said, right, prove it to me. 
or you sit on the bench. That's where your life will be in the future on that bench with me. Or you want to be out on a football pitch. You've got to do some actions that show me that you're ready to start games again. So I think that's where we are with Jaden. And I do think that the, the game itself and the result will give him a huge boost because you can now go back to the training ground and practice stuff. And just he just looked more confident to me, you know, from other weeks where he looked a bit stale. Just in that little cameo that he did, he just looked like a player that wanted it in a, you know, a Europa League match. You know, people mock it. I've mocked it in the past. And yet here we are. And these players are showing that they really want to play for Man United. Under the lights on Thursday night is where you need to deliver. Uh, any That's any it. final thoughts on that, Rob? Obviously, they play... Uh, it's Tottenham mid midweek next week. So I think there's a couple of weeks between the next Europa League game. Mm -hmm. Sheriff at Old Trafford, I believe. And... Uh, then Real Sociedad away in the last game. Any further thoughts or can we put this one to bed and concentrate on the Premier League for a little while? No, it's tough matches to come, whatever way you look at it. They're all, they're all big games, really, in a way, now all the way up to the World Cup. Uh, but just good to get this one done and dusted. You know, you got your three points. It doesn't matter if it's 1-0 or 5-0, not really that important. And I think it probably will go down to match day six, uh, on the road in Spain. And as you said, United need to win that by a couple of goals, something that they're, they're more than capable of doing, but they need to keep building, you see, until these points, because it's too easy to kind of get ahead of yourself and think, yeah, we're great. We've done really well. You know, like, you know, when they won four games on the bounce, five games on the bounce, and then played Man City. So, these, you know, reality will bite you. But I, I, I think it's good. I think United got back on the horse after the Manchester derby and they looked like a, a proper football team. It's not in the running order, Rob, but I did I had a, a brainwave. Right? Let's do a little transfer section okay. regarding European football this week. Did you see, for one, Diogo Costa's performance in the, in the goal for Porto? Yeah. Saving another penalty yeah. and shooting a 60-yard diagonal pass straight into the path of his winger who went on to score. Um, yeah. I don't know if you saw that one. Uh, and... I'm getting a little bit excited about that. I hope they go and uh, pursue that transfer. And then the other one is, I don't know if you've seen the, the fallout, and I don't know if his name is banned from this show, but Frankie de Jong came on for Barcelona and played really well, nearly dragged them over the line, but they are effectively, they're going to be joining Man United in the Europa League yep. uh, coming soon. Not confirmed yet, obviously. I think uh, Inter have got to win their next game, which is the easiest game they'll have in the group against Victoria Pulsen at San Siro in the next round of matches. And then yesterday, our friends at Sport have done uh, a new briefing on how unhappy Frankie de Jong is that he's not getting in the Barcelona team that he's playing at centre-back. And I'm, yeah, you got it right there, Rob. I'm, I'm shedding a tear for the lad. Uh, what do you make of all this? <laughs> it's all very predictable, isn't it? It's like, you know... They, I mean, they did tell him, like, you know, in the summer that this is what would happen. Uh, the Frankie Dion thing, as I said, like we've we've discussed it so much, haven't we? About the pros and the cons and the whys and the whys nots. Frankie Dion is going to struggle to exert his game on this Barcelona team. Now, if he does not know that and hasn't known that for the last X amount of months, as I keep saying, that is on him. He likes the lifestyle in Barcelona. It's one of the big upticks for him that's why he wants to stay there and yes it rains in Manchester a little bit more doesn't it well a lot more let's be honest I think it's 250 days a year it rains in Manchester that's that's a real stat so um I get it I totally get it but this whole Europa League thing Champions League thing it's also binary isn't it because it, it's about if you come to Man United then we want to be in the Champions League help us get there we'll pay you a lot of money to do it and show us that you can help us but here we are now, again, Frankie's not happy. What does that mean, Scott? For us as journalists, lots of reporting on noise coming from Spain, lots of noise from Frankie's camp. There's no doubt his agent will be on the phone to multiple people and we'll be talking about Frankie Dion again going into the World Cup, saying, right, is Frankie Dion going to go to Man United? And the answer is maybe, because United haven't really filled that spot. I still don't think Casemiro is the guy that fills that spot. But Christian Eriksen is the guy, I think, that makes it complicated for Frankie de Jong because it's not like United have maybe the same need they did the day they started pursuing Frankie. So 
Still lots to talk about. Will he come to Man United? Won't he? I still, I still kind of feel no, because I just he doesn't want to be in Manchester. That's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, if it was Man City after him, maybe he'd want to be in Manchester. I don't know. But we can't answer that at this stage. Yeah, poor Frankie. Uh, poor Frankie. Diogo Costa as well. We'll see what happens there. But uh, you know. I think you're on to a winner there, Scott. I think like, like there's no doubt that the guy is kind of auditioning for a bigger move. And he will get his bigger move. He will. And the Premier League is the 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 division with the biggest allure in the world. So... Everyone wants to come here because that's where you make your money and that's where the biggest trophies are on offer. Will Man United go for a goalkeeper? Still, I still think it's very kind of up and down because De Gea's improvements, I think, have a ceiling. So it's not like he's going to become the best sweeper keeper in the world. And it just think as the season develops, it depends whether Ten Hag looks at that position and says, Do you know what? If I get an upgrade there in goalkeeper, my back four becomes better. You know, that everything improves massively. I think that's the biggest fear for De Gea himself is that if there's someone out there doing it and you can go and get him and he's available, say, in January, could happen. Could happen indeed. Rob, I'm just going to I'm just going to move around a little bit. Uh, this is live action shot into live action shot. Uh, let's talk about the Newcastle game at the weekend because Man United play against Newcastle United on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. Mm. And... Difficult game. Newcastle have been in really good form so far this season. Playing well under Eddie Howe. They've got a midfielder in Bruno Guimaraes, who is mm-hmm. regarded as one of the form players in the league at the moment. They're yeah. scoring a lot of goals. They're playing progressive front foot football. Mm-hmm. Kieran Trippier plays for them. They have a lot of uh, momentum behind them. And this is a test for United at Old Trafford. This is the first of Three league games coming up, which could go either way in a very, very difficult fixtures and solid tests for Ten Hag's United. Yes, and the kind of games that if you drop five or ten percent for whatever reason, because you know we just talked about the weather, didn't it? Pours it down, uh, Old Trafford, and you can't pass the ball as as well or as accurately because the, the surface is too slick. All of these things can affect you. You've got to kind of get around them. If that happens to Man United, then this is exactly the kind of game where you could slip up. So if you're a Newcastle fan, depending on what your maybe political views are on stuff again, um, you'll be very happy, I think, with the way your team is playing and the way that your team is being developed. Um, and they look the real deal, Newcastle, to me. You know, like they look like a team that are on the up. Um would I have worried about Newcastle in previous years coming to Old Trafford? Absolutely not. I can remember games where they'd arrive and they'd be in the corner at Old Trafford singing their heads off and then we'd thrash them and they'd stop singing. So, But I can't see that this time around. I do think it'll give United a really good game. You just mentioned Kieran, Kieran Trippier there. Um, obviously, long-term Manchester United target from the past. Uh, also, Manchester United fan. So, you know, he'd get his dream coming back to Old Trafford like the, the goalkeeper for uh, Nicosia did uh, yesterday. Um, all of these narratives run side by side. Tough game for United. And they have to be... They have to be 100%. If you let if you let Newcastle attack you now, they're going to attack you. And I think Eddie Howe's done a really good job. Yeah, he has indeed. How's uh, Eric Ten Hag going to approach this one? Because obviously we saw a couple of changes last night. Mm. We saw Malassia come in for Luke Shaw, but Luke Shaw came on as a substitute. And I think he's probably wrestled that place back, hasn't he? That, that first totally. choice slot. Yeah. Uh, we have Anthony Martial, who Ten Hag, before the Ammonia game, said he might be ready for Newcastle. He might be. So we await, We wait to see how uh, that'll work. I think if he's fit, I think he might play, to be honest. Uh, yeah. And there's other... Uh, Ericsson, you know, came on for uh, 20 minutes or so against Ammonia as well. But I think we're starting to see the pieces fit together, aren't we? And how worried are you about Victor Lindelof? Do you think Rafa Varane will come back? <sighs> Am I the only one that's worried about Victor Lindelof? I feel like that sometimes. Like when he gets talked about, even even Eric Ten Hag in the presser was bigging him up the other day because he was it his two hundredth game yesterday. Was that right? So that was the story. Um, yeah, I'm worried. Did he was sat like, next to him. To be fair, he was. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see last night when that ball goes through the channel? I think it was Bruno on the counter attack. There, Bruno, not our Bruno. Um, he completely just walked past. Lindelof. Lindelof was like, chug, chug, chug. And if Bruno makes a good decision in that moment and just squares the ball, it's a goal. 
simple. That's on Lindelof again. So a uh, little bit worried about that because I think when you look at what Newcastle's weapons and what they can do, uh, their formation means that they'll overload those channels at times. And I really, yeah, I fear for Lindelof. I don't want Lindelof anywhere near the start in 11. Uh, you just mentioned Anthony Martial. Uh, I think he will be fit. I just think it's just a case now that Ten Hag might be a little bit more reserved about starting him just yet because it just seems to be that you start him, like he gets injured in a warm up, not even in the game. He's getting injured in warm up. So that's a problem. But the other issue, of course, is that Cristiano's now kind of started or played three full games on the bounce. Is Cristiano fit enough to do it? I think your other option now is that we bring Jaden Sancho back into the starting 11. Obviously, Anthony starts on the right. Therefore, you can play Marcus Rashford through the middle. And I, I think we might see that as the starting front three for this match. On Ronaldo, how have you... Uh, you mentioned there that he's played a few games now. Yeah. He's looking a little bit fitter. We yeah. know our long-term uh, thoughts on Ronaldo, but have you seen an improvement and an adjustment to Ten Hag's methods from him? Definitely. Like, you know, no, definitely. Like, I, I don't think that, you know, as moody as Cristiano can be and as problematic as he can be, I think in terms of his stardom kind of overshadowing what you're trying to do at the football club, I think he's come in and trying to show the manager that he wants to take his chance. But what's the issue last night against Ammonia, uh, uh, Ammonia uh, uh, Scott? was that you had loads of shots, didn't you? How many good shots did Cristiano have in that match? How many good opportunities? Yeah, there wasn't yeah, many. Like, we know. can't talk about them because they didn't happen. Yeah. They weren't real. He had he had one which was a rebound off the goalkeeper. But the point was, and, the, and this is the, the point we keep trying to make week after week after week, is that he damages your attack. He doesn't help you. He doesn't actually... He, he's not your... Uh, you know, big name striker on the end of everything. He's not that, you know, and that's what he gets sold as. Oh, Ronaldo scores goals. Does he? I don't know. Like, like because you got 20 last year that people say, oh yeah, it's true. But I think you saw last night in that kind of game, it's actually Rashford in the channel getting the chances and the ball coming from wider areas. Yes, Cristiano is making runs. Yes, Cristiano is helping the function. But overall, you know, is he the same guy? I just... I just don't see it game to game. And I'm really not trying to just pick holes on him, which is why I didn't mention his name at the start of the show. Because <laughs> I think people are like, oh, that Rob Blanchett's always after Cristiano. And I'm really not. I'd rather he's got a hat-trick every week. And we'd go, yeah, we won the match. So I, I think that's the big that's the big, that's the big question. And looking for the answer with Cristiano now with the manager is that can you keep him in the team week after week, three games in a row? You might need a little bit of a rest. I haven't asked this question for a while, Rob, but this show is uh, called The Promised Land for a mm. reason. Uh, it is the, the theory behind the name is how long will it take? Let's follow Man United's journey back to the promised land, which was a line from Clive Tildesley's uh, you know, uh, commentary for the, the goal in 99, mm -hmm. which Ollie scored. A long way off, but how confident overall are you feeling ahead of a difficult patch of games? that United are now heading in the right direction. I'm not asking you how long is it going to take for Man United to win the Champions League again, because that's going to be years down the line. <laughs> but Or is it? <laughs> we'll see. They've got to get in the Champions League first this season. Exactly, yeah. How are you... Uh, are you? Is your optimism changed? Are you seeing stuff in players now that is positive? We both know, and we both know that there's a lot of work to do. But is Eric Ten Hag proving to be the right... With, with with the things that he's doing, with the things that he's saying, with the actions that he's taking, is he moving in the right direction towards taking Man United back to where a manager hasn't taken them for, you know, since Sir Alex Ferguson? Eric's at the wheel. It's coming. Um, <laughs> you have to look, clip that up or you bang the table. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. You know, you can make on <laughs> my microphone can pick that up. Lovely there. Look. Yes, is the answer to that in, in the short term. Is, is he doing the right things? Are we seeing the right things completely? And I think that if you have patience and you realise this is a staggered process, a staggered development, then I think you can only be happy with what you've seen. That will include defeats. That will include really, really horrible performances. Every now and then you're going to go up to a Brentford and Brentford are going to give you a spanking. You're going to lose 4-0. You're going to be like, what's happened? The earth will feel like it's shattered. 
But he's doing the right things. He's doing this. This is giving players the opportunity. He's building this nice and slowly. Uh, I'll give the same example I've given before about, say, the Champions League. Like, if you get in the Champions League, then you've always got the chance of winning it. Chelsea's two Champions League victories in their history have come with probably their two worst teams in a 20 year period. Yeah, it's the truth. They won their first Champions League with Roberto Di Matteo as their coach. Yeah, so that was one. And then you've got Tuchel who somehow magically helped them win the Champions League, obviously against Man City. And that showed a year later in the league that Chelsea is still quite dysfunctional, but we're champions of the world. So it can happen. You don't actually need to complete your project, you know, like a big, huge jigsaw and you put the last piece in and that's the big trophy. Football doesn't work like that. Football can be quite abstract. So I'm really pleased with what Eric's doing and what the players are doing. And that's what I'm looking for is a relationship between the squad outwardly in their performances and what the manager's doing on the touchline and seeing if those things are meshing together. There's no doubt it's meshing together. And I think United, with the, with the transfers that they've had over the past six months or so like that, it, it was like the first steps. Like the players that came in, it, it wasn't like a, a big horrendous ripping up of stuff. It was like, well, you're all out of contract. You lot are going to be out of contract. So I need these four or five players to start the project and let's move forward. That's where United are today. They've not even gone and bought those final pieces of the jigsaw yet. So let's see what happens. Again, I think it's, you know, pundits, United fans or whatever can get very excited. That's why I did the whole Ollie's at the wheel impression there, because that was a moment where I even felt it. I remember going, yeah, Ollie's at the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like weeks, months, years later, it gets clipped up and shoved in your face because that's how football is. Um, but I am so, so delighted, I think, with how Eric Ten Hag is handling the job at present. Yeah, I was speaking to an Ajax fan on uh, Wednesday night, I believe, yeah. we were watching Ajax get, for the second time, smashed by Napoli, uh, yeah. and seeing Liverpool 4-1-0 down to Rangers before they won 7-1. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, we were talking about Ten Hag, and this Ajax fan is a colleague of mine at, at uh, minute media 90 min and he said pretty much what i the, the way that i've been thinking about things and everything that i've learned about eric ten Hag before is that it is a process it is mm. it will take some time and he was very gutted to see eric ten Hag leave yeah and to see anthony leave as well who they yeah they're getting a little bit of stick for for not replacing now given they knew that all along that united would probably come back in for him but yeah i think i think the message is here like just Maybe my message to it, if you're a fan, don't get too overboard. And this, We're a moderate show. <laughs> don't get too overboard, but just look at everything through a longer-term lens is what I would say. Because, And my justification for why Casemiro wasn't making the team straight away, I think it's because Eric Ten Hag wants his players to follow a plan and it takes time mm. to learn his plan. And this was kind of uh, just communicated to me back again by the Ajax fan that I was speaking to. It takes time and you'll see the fruits of the labor if everything goes right, if players get on board with it later down the line. But it's not, he had a difficult time at Axe to start with as well. He had mm. to build his squad and it took time, but eventually they became one of the most fashionable, entertaining teams in Europe before the squad got ripped out from him. Uh, and that's happened twice to Axe in the last five years. Shouldn't happen to Man United. So let's just be patient with him. Even if they lose to Newcastle this weekend, I don't think that's going to change too much really because I'm looking at this through the long-term lens and I think you're totally right and I think that's the way to do it and this was why it felt even in the earliest days that Ten Hag was say a better fit for United than Antonio Conte so it's not that one is better than the other I'm sure Conte would get all his trophies out and say I'm the better candidate for the job but it was more about what are you trying to build why are you trying to build it and how are you going to build it and you know Conte would have spent 300 million in a go if he could have done won the league and then gone because that's what he does <laughs> in general you know but I think when you look at, at Ten Hag I feel he's here for the long term and he wants to get it right and he's going to do it slowly but surely like you just said there I think all his former clubs even uh, pre-Ajax he's always had these difficult opening months where he's working stuff out he's on a training pitch he's doing a lot of work Again, another of my catchphrases, you play the game up here. You do. All the prep goes into the brain. Intelligent footballers win you football matches. Players can run as much as they like, but it's intelligence that takes you to the next level. Man City run like dogs, but it's their 
absolutely disgusting levels of intelligence that beat you. And that's how they work. That's the, that's the ethic. So United have got to find that because I think they've been caught between a rock and a hard place for years about, should we run more? Should we pass more? Oh, should... Well, yeah, pass the ball better, please. But you've got to still keep running. You've got to still keep working. You've got to have the attitude. It's all got to be there. And I think this is what Ten Hag is, is trying to develop. And this is why the Ronaldo thing is a conundrum, isn't it? Because we know Cristiano overshadows a lot of this work and a lot of this stuff both behind the scenes and in front of the cameras. Um, I think that maybe not this next window in January, but maybe the next window, that could be where United find their Mane or their Salah or someone like that, whoever that might be. You know, I'm not going to put names on the table today, but that could be where they then make the next step and you go from being Arsenal 12 months ago. I know we always mention Arsenal on this show. It's not just for Harry, who's our producer behind the scenes here. Mm -hmm. But Arsenal 12 months ago were a bit of a hot mess. You know, good young players, older players that don't really help you a lot, but collect a load of money. And you've got to kind of iron out all of those creases. And then you're somewhere. And I said, in the middle of last year, I think Arsenal will be title contenders next year. And I got derided across every podcast I said that on because they were like, no chance. They're bottom of the league. They're terrible. Arteta will get sacked. So I see United in that image. I go, if, if we do it slowly and surely, and you, you promote the youth, you give you empower players rather than, you know, rip away their opportunities and you get somewhere, you're going to be all right. You will be title contenders. So I'll say it now. Can Man United be title contenders this time next year? Yes. Can they? Will they? Yes. We'll see. Uh, got two windows. Be... You've got two windows in your developing the team for 12 months and a manager that looks pretty good. So can you go and buy three, four, five players in that window of 12 months and really kind of go to another level where, where going to Brentford's not a problem anymore, Scott? You know what I mean? You go to Brentford and you just win 1-0 because it's all right. You just stop them and you win 1-0. That's where United have to be, like City. It's, you'd have to be brilliant every week. You just have to go and beat teams every week. So winning is an art form, but winning is also not rocket science. Find ways to win. You can become a very good team. That Liverpool team is getting derided, isn't it? And it was 1-0 down at Rangers. And it was, like, oh, Liverpool were awful, aren't they? And they won 7-1. You know, so you find your ways to get back to where you need to be. And if you avoid injuries then you can move forward very fast. Just look at what Arsenal have done. Be a good test of United's metal in the Premier League over the next week or so. They have uh, Newcastle United, Tottenham at Old Trafford, both games at Old Trafford, and then a trip to Chelsea next weekend, which should be interesting to say the least, uh, United mm. winning in the Europa League on Thursday night. Any final thoughts for the show today, Rob, before I wrap it? No, like we, 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 I think we've talked quite positively today as well, like we usually do. Um, but I'm looking forward to Chelsea as well. You know, that, that game to me is, is another opportunity. Like when we played Arsenal and played Liverpool and punched them both on the chin and took the points. You can get a Stamford Bridge with this current Chelsea team, which is improving, I think, under Potter, certainly in, in systematically, and go and punch them on the chin, take the points again. It is possible. I think the Newcastle game is tougher at home where the expectation is there. And maybe United will have maybe a lot, you know, 60% of the possession. Uh, Newcastle will want to play on the counter-attack. So let's see. I think uh, United are in a good place. And uh, I think now with Europa League, you can kind of put that to one side for a little bit. The Tottenham game upcoming, I think, is a tough match. Um, Sun seems to be coming back into form, which is always a it's always typical, isn't it? You know, it's he's been out of form and then suddenly starts to score goals. And that itself, these two games, Newcastle and, and Spurs, are, are potential banana skins, aren't they? Because even though you're playing well or you feel good about it, those two teams are both very good and they can come to Old Trafford and take the points off you. I think it's a real good test of where United are as a team and in yeah. Everett Ten Hag's project. And we'll see how they deal with difficult challenges. Uh, let's wrap up anyway for today. You can subscribe to our show through Apple Google, Spotify, and the likes on a pod on your know, whichever podcast network you prefer. I think we're we're everywhere pretty much. We're also on YouTube, upload twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. So head over to the channel, the Promised Land, a Manchester United podcast. Hit the like button on this video and every video that we've ever done. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Leave a comment as well, uh, and get in touch with Rob and I on Twitter too at underscore Scott Saunders at underscore Rob underscore B and at Promised Land MU for the show. Rob, thank you very much again. Always a pleasure to talk to you. We will wait and see how Man United do against Newcastle in the upcoming Premier League fixture. And until next time, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon.